Hello friends, let me welcome you to back to the lecture channel. Here we are talking about the characteristics and classification of living organism. Uh, it is the syllabus of IGCAC students and uh, the name of the syllabus is 0610. Uh, so uh, it's in Cambridge syllabus. So uh, the other students uh, who are from CBAC, ICAC, if they wish to watch it, they can watch it. Um, uh, here we are basically talking about two things. The first thing that we'll be talking about is the characteristics of living organism and the second thing that we'll be talking is the classification of living organisms. Uh, so let's start with me. My name is Jitin and uh, you can follow me. You can follow us or uh, follow us to download or get the PDF file of this particular notes file. Um, on the Instagram. Uh, the Instagram links are given in the uh, description box of the YouTube channel. And uh, please note that uh, the fund which is generated uh, from this particular YouTube channel will be totally going for social development. So let's start people. Uh, we are talking about the characteristics of living organisms. So you can remember the characteristics of living organism by Mrs. Gran. Please understand the fact that uh, the characteristics of living organisms are not uh, only Mrs. Gran. We can have certain more characteristics also. But in our syllabus of IGC, IGCSE, we have only uh, this uh, seven characteristics. So let's quickly understand uh, what all these characteristics are and what are the definitions of them. So we are first of all starting with the movement. So movement is basically an action by an organism or by the part of an organism. Either an organism itself, a full organism is doing an action or a movement um, uh, or the part of an organism is doing uh, the action. And that action need to cause the change in the position. There should be a change in the position or there should be a change in the place of a living organism. A very important thing that you need to understand here is that the movement has to be by self. Okay, uh, let, let me give you an example to uh, enhance your understanding on this. Let's say we basically have a sand of heap here and uh, wind is flowing in this direction. So the sand heap moves to this particular place. So what is happening over here is that there is a change in the position and there is a change in the place taking place. So uh, is this uh, sand of heap living? The answer is no, it is not at all living. Uh, why? Because uh, the movement is not by self. The movement has to be by self. Okay, so let's quickly move on to respiration. Uh, the respiration is basically defined or it can be said as a chemical reaction. Uh, please understand this. I'm, I'm writing it as chemical reactions. It's not a single chemical reaction as we have written in this definition, I mean this equation over here. So where does uh, this uh, steps of, uh, means uh, approximately, there are so many uh, steps inside it. Uh, uh, it's a full process uh, in this uh, we have the glucose molecule uh, breaking down we have few steps in uh, glycolysis like uh, and then further on we have say cy Krebs cycle so it varies it depends upon the type of um, respiration also that how many steps it will be having or how many uh, um, re chemical reactions will be there inside it so for right now you can understand that it's just a, it's a series of chemical reactions and they take place in the living cells and what happened in this case is that there is a breakdown taking place the breakdown of what there is a breakdown of the nutrient molecules the nutrient molecule which is generally broken over here is your glucose molecule and this is going to release what is required for the body that is ATP this ATP we are going to use for our daily need this ATP we are going to use for our enzymes this ATP we are going to use for our movement this A ATP we are going to use for our sensitivity this uh, ATP we are using for the growth so all the processes uh, you know which requires energy instead of a body will be uh, you know uh, will be getting those energy by the process of respiration only now uh, 
now metabolism now let's understand uh, what of the energy is released that is released for the metabolism so metabolism basically means uh, in a simple language if i say all reactions all reactions of a living organism uh, will be called as a metabolism so if if you need to enhance more the on the definition of the metabolism you can say that um, it is the sum total of all the reactions which are taking place in a living system okay so that is metabolism so what you are understanding over here is that we have a glucose molecule uh, that is uh, you know reacting with the oxygen molecule and giving us the carbon dioxide water and energy please understand the fact that this is your aerobic respiration now aerobic respiration is a respiration which is taking place in the presence of oxygen so what will be the next one next type of it the next type will be an aerobic respiration so the anaerobic respiration will be taking in the absence of oxygen so about that we'll be discussing in the upcoming chapters in detail now let's move on to the sensitivity so sensitivity is basically the ability of an organism to detect or sensor stimuli now stimuli basically means what stimuli basically means it's a change in the environment okay right now let's say uh, it is uh, let's say for simple example it is uh, 30 degrees celsius what will happen if i make it uh, zero degree celsius that is uh, you know that is uh, what we're gonna feel out that is what we can feel the difference in the temperature so stimuli basically or that is what the change that environment taking place that change in the environment is basically called as a stimuli and this stimuli has to be detected in the case of sensitivity so uh, the stimuli can be internal stimuli or the stimuli can be external stimuli so if i need to give you an example for the internal stimuli let's uh, let's talk about hunger it's an internal stimuli thrust uh, if you're feeling thirsty uh, that is an internal stimuli temperature touch light etc are basically your external stimuli one thing that you need to understand in this that is there should be an appropriate response made suppose you have a stimuli let's say the uh, initial the temperature was 30 degrees celsius later on the temperature became zero degrees celsius if an organism is not responding it's not giving an appropriate response towards it then uh, that is not a part of sensitivity the organism must give a uh, specific or appropriate response regarding that okay so let's quickly move on to the growth now uh, growth is basically defined as the permanent increase in the size and dry mass now the question arises what is this dry mass so let's quickly understand this uh, I have a leaf okay and now if I vein this leaf uh, I just I've just recently plucked out this leaf from a plant and if I vein this leaf right now that will be called as the wet mass of it now let's say if I remove a uh, water from it okay so in that case the mass that I will get is basically the dry mass okay so growth is basically the permanent increase in the size and the dry mass uh, now how this particular uh, increase is taking place this particular increase is taking place by increase in the cell number or by increase in the cell size cell number basically means what one cell getting divided into two cells so that is how cell numbers are increasing cell size the cell size basically means the cell was like this and later on it became like this the size of the cell has increased or both of them both of them also can take place uh, to provide growth for a living organism the uh, the bacterial growth you know which we have is uh, you know usually measured in the terms of the cell size or cell number or we can say both of them are uh, same only or to be more specific uh, growth and reproduction in the case of uh, bacteria or unicellular organism is more or less same only now reproduction uh, is basically the process that makes more of the same kind of organism 
and uh, the organism will be making similar kind of organisms so that is reproduction the types include asexual and asexual reproduction asexual reproduction basically means so one parent is used fusion of gametes is not there sexual basically means two parents are involved and there is a fusion of gametes in it now most of the people generally get confused with the uh, excretion uh, definition of excretion uh, in your IGCC examination they generally ask uh, or they give a specific data and they ask you to figure out what kind of uh, characteristics of living organism is, is being shown by that particular picture or by a particular uh, group of lines or a paragraph okay so uh, most of the people generally get confused with the excretion so let's quickly understand this so uh, excretion you already know that there is something which is getting removed from an organism uh, the thing which are generally removed from the organisms in there are three things which are generally removed the first one is the waste product this waste products are basically derived from the metabolism now uh, if i give you an example of the waste product let's say urea what happens in the case of urea uh, let's understand the case of urea you're taking protein inside your body so this protein is go the excess um, this going inside your body an excess amount of protein is uh, sorry the is going inside your body and it is getting converted into aa aa here stands for amino acids so the excess amount of amino acids uh, are broken down into two things the first thing is the urea and the second thing is the energy rich compound so this energy rich compound is used by the body and the waste and toxic material that is urea is removed from the body so here what is happening the thing which is happening out here the thing which is happening over here is a chemical reaction or is a metabolic reactions which are taking place over here okay so from that also we are getting to know that there are some waste product like uh, urea like your bilirubin so bilirubin is what basically makes your um, uh, your poop yellowish brown in color so that's bilirubin and this bilirubin is indirectly formed by the breakdown of your rbc's uh, so that is uh, the uh, metabolic waste which your body is producing Apart from that, by the food, you would have taken some of the toxic materials. So if you remove them, that is also the excretion. If you remove the substances which are in excess of requirements, that is also uh, the part of excretion. The last thing that you need to understand in this is the nutrition. So what is nutrition? So uh, that's very simple, people. Uh, it's just the process of uh, taking in the materials what materials generally we take uh, in the case of human beings we can call it as the food or in the in the case of animals we can directly call it as food uh, but we are using the word materials because we are uh, uh, talking about both plant as well as the animal over here so we are taking certain materials for what we are taking those materials for energy we are taking those materials for the growth we are taking those materials for the development so that is basically the process of nutrition so you're taking certain material inside your body so that your body can have energy your body can have a proper growth your body can have a proper development now in the case of plant uh, they are getting the nutrition by the process of photosynthesis so photosynthesis is basically a process uh, uh, which is coming under the nutrition so what you know what you already know is that uh, uh, they take carbon dioxide they take water and they take some ions the ion i'm talking here about is magnesium or well, let's say we are talking about the nitrate ions we'll be talking about this in the upcoming classes so uh, the animal basically and by using all these resources like light carbon dioxide water and iron the plant are basically making your glucose the glucose is converted into cellulose starch uh, then sucrose like that it is converted into so many organic compounds and these organic compounds are used by human beings okay or, or we can say by the in general we can say they are used by the animals so um and that is all that is all about the process of nutrition please understand this here we require water water 
and ions also apart from organic stuff. In the case of plant also, both of them are required. So let's quickly move on to the next topic that we have people. The next topic that we have here is uh, the concept and use of classification system. So what is the con what are the concepts and uh, uh, what are the uses of classification system? So there are certain points, uh, some basic points, we'll discuss them. Uh, the first point says that uh, all organisms can be classified into groups. So we have uh, so many groups and uh, certain of the groups are basically written over here. That is uh, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus and species. So what you need to understand is that in total we have five kingdoms. So out of those five kingdoms, we're gonna, let's say, let's take one kingdom. In one kingdom, there will be so many phylums. In one phylum, there will be so many classes. And in, in one of the classes, there will be so many orders. And in one order, there are going to be so many families inside it. So, like that, it keeps on going. And so, remember this. You can go with, um, you can go with the fact that uh, keep pot, you can go with keep pot clean. Otherwise, family get sick okay so you can remember uh, this full full order in this particular way keep pot clean otherwise the family get sick so k for kingdom p for phylum uh, please understand this uh, in certain cases you may find division also so the division word is basically meant for plants and the phylum word is basically meant for uh, this phylum word is basically meant for the animals okay so class, um, C for class and order, then family, genus and species. Now, how do we define species? People, you have already learned this in your uh, previous classes. Uh, so let's quickly go um, again with the definition of species. So how do we say that two of the living organisms will, are belonging to the same species? The first thing that you need to look into is the appearance. So that basically means they must have uh, they must have the same appearance. That means they must have the same uh, morphology. So we want to use the word morphology over here. They must have the same behavior also. Okay. And apart from that, the very important thing is that they should be able to reproduce. Both of them should be able to reproduce. And on to that, they should be able to produce the fertile offspring. Uh, if the fertile offspring is not produced, then we cannot say them. Uh, be, them uh, we cannot say that they are belonging to the same species indirectly. That's basically a question mark. Let me give you an example for this. Let's say we basically have a horse and we basically have a donkey. So we get, when we're gonna breed them, uh, what we get is basically the mules. So what we find is that the mules do not reproduce. They are unfertile organisms. Okay. So that's from that we get an idea that the horse and the donkey do not belong to the same species. And the another thing which you are getting to know over here is that this species uh, is basically the smallest group of classification. Uh, we have so many uh, other things underneath the species also, but that is not there in the syllabus, so we will not discuss them as of right now. The next thing that you need to understand is that the traditional system of classification was based on morphology. So as recently I have told you that it is the appearance, it is study of outer appearance of an organism. Now anatomy will be the opposite of this. So anything um, you know which you can study with the help of dissection, you know, that will be coming in the anatomy. Or we can say in simple language, the study of internal structures. So the traditional system was totally based on the morphology and the anatomy of the living organisms. Now, um, this is something very important uh, that recently or nowadays, what we're going to do, what we do is basically we are looking at the basis of the DNA. So DNA is basically the genetic material uh, inside the cells. And this DNA basically helps in making the protein. So like, um, 
what is uh, it is helping in the making of amino acid and this amino acid indirectly are helping in the making of the protein let me give an example for this the eye color almost uh, let's say i have a reddish uh, sorry i have basically a reddish brown eye color or I, uh, it's not reddish brown it's a chocolatey brown uh, eye color some of us basically have black some of them have some of us basically have blue also so that is because of the different protein why the protein is different in them because there is a different amino acid why amino acids are different because there is a different dna sequences so what are the base sequence of the dna will get uh, will, uh, will, it will be coming in upcoming um, discussions so let's quickly move further so uh, now what we find is that the dna is basically the basically the more accurate mean of classifications so let's uh, let's understand this we basically have the dna uh, let's dna basically have something called as atcg this atcgs are basically called as the basis of the dna let's say one of the dna one of the dna of an organism is having G C G T T A A. This kind of organism is there. Let's say we have another organism like this. C C G C G T T T A. And let's say we have another organism. Let's say um, let's say we have T T T G G G A A A T T. So let's say this is organism number one. This is organism number two. This is organism number three. So which two organisms are more similar? Of course, the organism number two and three will be more similar because the sequence of the DNA are similar, almost similar in both of them. So that's why we get an idea that uh, DNA is more accurate way of. Uh, um, classifying the living organism so let's talk about the basic of the dna and uh, the basic of the dna and uh, where the where do we find this particular dna so this you have already studied in your lower classes people so let's have a quick recap of it so we basically uh, we basically have a cell cell basically have a nucleus inside the nucleus we basically have something called as chromatin so chromatin get converted into your chromosomes when the cell divides okay so inside this chromosomes we basically have two things the first thing that we have is the dna and the second thing that we have is the some small proteins inside it okay uh, so uh, we'll be talking about the proteins in higher classes and um, dna is basically um, the genetic material in almost all organism except certain viruses certain viruses basically have rna as a genetic material so uh, that is what it has come on to that uh, the dna is basically made up of nitrogenous basis why we are calling it as a nitrogenous basis because uh, uh, it's very simple that they are having nitrogen inside it so that's why we are calling it as nitrogenous basis so what are these nitrogenous bases uh, adenine thymine cytosine guanine so we rem uh, we we can remember it with atcg at chandigarh or let's say uh, at chatisgarh so uh, something like that you can make uh, of your choice and you can remember so what is what it is trying to say the atcg sequences are more similar in two organism if the atcg sequences are more similar in two organism that basically means they are closely related and if they're closely related that basically means they have a recent common ancestor in them the ancestor is common in them and if they have a different atg sequences that basically means they are not closely related and they do not have a recent common ancestor instead of that they have basically far away common ancestor uh, this is what we have learned that the different sequence of ATCG, uh, ATCG will be forming different type of proteins so i just gave you an example of eye so eye, eye color eye pigmentation okay so let's quickly go with the next point that organisms which share a more common more recent uh, share a more recent ancestor have base sequences in the dna that are more similar than that of the share only distant ancestor so this is what you have already started uh, right now only in the previous points so um, 
uh, we as I told you uh, we are talking about the classification I told you that we have five kingdoms so the first kingdom that we have is the prokaryotes which generally includes the uh, bacteria and their sisters which are called as mycoplasmas so um, and then we have the second kingdom prote protoctist we can call it as proto protozo protistas also and uh, we have the third one fungi uh, fourth one is plant and fifth one is animalia so how do we differentiate between them so uh, what are the differentiations which we have inside them so let's quickly talk about that so we have the prokaryotic and eukaryotic uh, prokaryotic basically means the nucleus is uh, well developed is not well developed instead of nucleus they basically have nucleoid inside it now when i say nucleus is not well developed that basically means the nuclear membrane is not there so let's take the case of a well developed nucleus so this is basically my well developed nucleus and inside you can you see this membrane which i have drawn right now so these membranes are basically the nuclear membrane and this is basically your full cell inside this this is your uh, dna or genetic material so what is happening out here is that uh, the nuclear membrane is present and apart from that there is cell organelles which are present inside it so what are the cell organelles which are present inside it let's say we have the mitochondria we have uh, uh, the lysosomes we basically have ribosomes ribosomes are big, again a big question mark even they are present in the case of uh, prokaryotes also so um, then we can go for certain like endoplasmic reticulum uh, so like that we have so many organelles we can go for chloroplast we can go for uh, some uh, leucoplast and like that uh, um, and we can go for even chromoplast so like that we have a, a list of organelles which will be studying in the second chapter so uh, so that is a major difference so the first difference is basically the nucleus is not well developed instead of calling it as a nucleus we call it as nucleoid what is the difference the nuclear membrane is not there that means the nucleoplasm the liquid which is present inside the nucleus mixes with the liquid which is present in the cytoplasm so they are mixing together in the case of your um, prokaryotic organism in the eukaryotic organism they are separated by the enum that is the nuclear membrane so um, that is the difference between prokaryote eukaryote unicellular multicellular you already know one thing you need to understand is that when i say unicellular or single celled organism that that basically means that one cell is able to do the full processes of a living organism that basically means let me give you an example if i take one cell out of your body that one cell will die but if i keep one amoeba somewhere it will not die it will be able to do the process of uh, it will be independently able to do the process of respiration it will be independent to do the process of digestion and everything possible so that is the difference between uh, the unicellular or we can say to be more specific single celled organism and the multicellular organisms so with cell wall and without cell wall this you have been learning from your uh, lower classes that the organisms can be classified into two with cell wall and without cell wall and the next one is whether they are photosynthetic or non photosynthetic so let's quickly talk about uh, the name of the five kingdom and the basic characteristics so the first kingdom which is here we are calling as prokaryotes can also be called as the kingdom monera uh, they are basically prokaryotes in nature they are unicellular and they uh, they generally include the bacteria they include the my mycoplasmas the major difference is that the major um, let's say some of most of the bacteria generally have a cell wall and whereas the mycoplasmas does not have it so there's an interesting fact over here the smallest living organism we have is pplo and this pplo is basically a mycoplasma that stands for pleuro pneumonia like organisms so pplo is basically the pleuro pneumonia like organisms and they are the smallest living organism on the earth um, 
and uh, one thing that you need to understand is that some of the bacteria can be photosynthetic that means they have some green pigment by which they can uh, perform uh, the process of photosynthesis some of them are chemosynthetic chemosynthetic basically means they're going to use some chemicals to uh, develop energy okay and uh, they do not have mitochondria they do not have other cell organelles also and uh, some of them are beneficial like that of the curd like that of your yakut drink you're talking about and uh, now even though yakut drink is basically a question mark uh, people have raised some um, allegations on it so what is uh, is it really good or bad that we need to look into okay so some of them are harmful like uh, we we get the typhoid uh, we get the cholera disease uh, we get a large number of diseases like the very chronic one that is the tb uh, that is caused by mycobacterium tuberculosis so like that we have a list of it so um, uh, let's go with the next one the next one that we have is uh, the kingdom protista the kingdom protista or we can call it as protoctist protoctist so this protoctist is basically eukaryotes so all the next kingdoms like uh, the uh, protista fungi plantain and animalia all of them are basically eukaryotic and they are again unicellular like that of the monera and uh, chlorophyll is found in some of them and uh, some of them uh, some of them like uh, if i give you example you can take uh, clamidomonas clamidomonas is basically the one which has uh, chlorophyll inside it so some of them may have chlorophyll inside it or if i give you another example euglena it has chlorophyll inside it uh, certain other examples include our amoeba which is very common which is of irregular shape paramecium is basically a sleeper shape structure so and gonulox is very famous recently because of the red uh, sea tide you would have seen it in uh, seen it on the twitter instagram and facebook everywhere you would have seen a lake which turned uh, pinkish in color that was just because of the gonulox uh, which is again a protista and uh, let's talk about the fungi now quickly so fungi are again eukaryotic in nature they are multicellular except we have an exception out here that is the yeast yeast is basically unicellular now they basically have something called as an hyphae and they have something called as mycelium so what is this hyphae so hyphae is basically a thread like structure and when we combine these thread like structures what we're gonna get is basically the mycelium so let me see if i have a picture of it at the back of this chapter so yes uh, i think i don't have a picture of it yes this is the picture i was talking about so this individual thread like structure is basically called as hyphae whether it is here or whether it is at the root side it will be called as hyphae when you're going to club them together then it will be called as mycelium so uh, this is basically your mushroom so that is basically your uh, rhizopus i feel if i'm correct that the scientific name is the rhizopus and um, that is something uh, uh, basic of uh, mushrooms that uh, they are belonging to a kingdom fungi they are, that is basically a kind of fungi and um, okay so what is the next point uh, they are saprophytic in nature what do you mean by saprophytic saprophytic basically means they are going to feed or they're gonna take your nutrition from dead and decaying matter so you would have seen, seen that the mushrooms are basically found in those areas only examples include your mushrooms it includes your bread mold and all kind of different molds which we get on the fruits they are the examples of it now this is something very interesting to be noted over here people that the uh, the classification system which we have you know it it reflects the evolutionary relationship the best example that we have here is the uh, mud skipper so i have a picture of the mud skipper to be shown so this is basically a mud skipper so it's a, it's a connection link between uh, the fishes uh, the fishes and the amphibians so what you need to understand is that fishes are basically aquatic in nature whereas the amphibians require water only for the process of uh, 
reproduction so what you're finding is that they are coming that there's a that's a connection link this mud skippers are the connection link between them and that is showing the evolutionary relationship uh, between two of the uh, big groups we'll be talking about these groups in uh, uh, your uh, classification of this animalia okay so uh, let's quickly go with the next one uh, this is something very important people generally they ask in the examination my target for this is to finish uh, the chapter one within one hour and um, so let's talk about this uh, binomial system people so binomial system by basically means two nomial basically means naming so you're going to name an organism with the two names indirectly uh, that is basically an internationally agreed system and uh, it is being followed almost everywhere on the earth and uh, it is made up of two names of as I have told that is made up of two names that is first name is a genus name and second one is a species name. Uh, this was given by our Carlos Linnaeus and that's the reason that he is called as father of taxonomy. So taxonomy deals with identification first identification classification and finally the nomenclature so nomenclature basically means the process of naming so you're going to identify a living organism you're going to classify and you're going to name an organism so this all processes are uh, the part of the taxonomy so what are the rules these rules are extremely important people uh, the genus name is always written first and that too with a capital letter the example out here is this the canis the c is uh, the capital and it, uh, this canis here basically is your genus species name is written after this the, the species name over here is lupus and it, it, will, it will always start with a small letter and whenever they are handwritten let's say if i'm writing an example of osimum sanctum so if I'm writing them, I'm gonna write, I'm gonna underline them. So when they are when they are typed, they'll be typed in italics like this, like canis lupus. So that is the uh, scientific name of your wolf. And um, the founder's name can be, you know, at the back of it, like the uh, Betula alba, which is basically a plant, and L here basically. Uh, goes for the Linnaeus because he has done a, um, he would have helped uh, he would have uh, discovered this particular plant so some of the examples that we have uh, include the lupus uh, the canis lupus Danius plexippus is basically the monarch butterfly which we have so this is basically the monarch butterfly the, it's a very common butterfly which we see uh, then we have the Manis gigante, basically is your uh, giant pangolian. Giant pangolian is uh, this one. Yeah, this is giant pangolian. And uh, then we have the next one that is uh, the Triticum mastivum is basically your wheat. And just look, look at this. Naja Naja. This is basically the scientific name of Cobra. So uh, this uh, this first Naja is basically the name of the genus, and this second Naja with the small that is the name of the species. So this is something. The next example is something very important. Uh, Caloplaca Obame is basically a lichen. Uh, from Obame, you will be coming to know that it is name. Uh, to you know, I'm, I'm highlighting this word Obame, and it is named on or after the Obama, Barack Obama. So that is uh, uh, because he helped and he supported the research work. So that's why to honor him, uh, this particular lichen was named on his name. Uh, okay, so the next thing that we have is that uh, the features of uh, organisms. So what are the features that we have of all organisms? So we're going to discuss all these features uh, in a quick uh, way. So the first feature that I have already discussed is that all living organisms basically have cytoplasm, cell membrane and the DNA as a genetical material okay i'm not using the word here nucleus why because the prokaryotic organism does not have a nucleus in them okay instead of that they basically have a nucleoid which is not a well-developed nucleus so instead of uh, telling it as a nucleus we it's better to say that the genetical material 
uh, DNA, which is the identical material. So, what is cytoplasm? Cytoplasm is a jelly like substance majorly made up of water and it is having some solutes dissolved in it. And it is the one which is enclosing the cell organelles. Cell organelles, I have told you, mitochondria, ribosomes, lysosomes, endoplasmic reticulum, Golgi apparatus, like that. We have so many of them. Okay. So, all of them are basically found in the cytoplasm and even the nucleus is found inside the cytoplasm, if you say. The cell membrane is the outer membrane and it is basically made up of two layers. So, so this is uh, the picture of your cell membrane. So, can you see this head and tail like this head and tail like structure? This is basically the lipid molecule. So, if you look into the picture, you're going to find that one layer of the lipid molecule, second layer of the lipid molecule. So, that's why we call it as by lipid layer and in between you're going to find that there is some proteins and these proteins uh, are acting as a channel or they can be having some small carbohydrate chain on the, on the top of it which may be acting as a marker so you'll be talking about this marker in the upcoming chapter chapters of immunity and over there we'll be calling them as the antigens so that uh, is something very important so if you guys remember i was talking about this diagram only we basically have uh, the cell inside the cell when the cell divides the chromosomes are formed and uh, this is what your chromosome would look like so when you're gonna unwind these chromosomes you're gonna find some proteins and the name of the proteins are histones and then you're gonna have something called as a dna and the dna is basically made up of a t c g this different sequence of a t c g so that is uh, about this and uh, uh, DNA is basically the it stands for deoxyribonucleic acid and it's a double helical structure. What I mean by double helical structure, it will be somewhat like this. This is basically a double helical structure. Now, list other important features in the cell of a living organism. So the very important feature in all the living organism is that it is having ribosomes in it and these ribosomes are for the process of protein synthesis so what is this protein synthesis let me see if i have a picture for you people uh, in that case it'll be easy for me to explain now we don't have a picture so protein synthesis is basically a process uh, uh, you know i have told you also in the beginning uh, that we basically have dna uh, looking at the DNA, there will be formation of mRNA and this mRNA will be leading to the formation of AA that is will be leading to the formation of proteins. So AA here basically means amino acid. So what will happen is that when DNA forms the mRNA, this mRNA will go and bind to some teddy bear like structure. So this teddy bear like structure is basically ribosome and onto this there will be our uh, mRNA molecule binding okay and uh, and looking at the sequence of this RNA will be now forming okay looking at the sequence of DNA we are forming the RNA and looking at the sequence of mRNA we are going to form the amino acid so different uh, so the different type of amino acids will be formed over here let's say one amino acid is this one let's say the another amino acid is this one so another amino acids are let's say this one so different kind of amino acids are formed so this different amino acid will be leading to the formation of different proteins so indirectly if ribosome is not there uh, protein synthesis will be a question mark so that's why we are calling ribosome as uh, protein factory and uh, the second very important thing which is for the very important features of all the living cell is that uh, respiration is a process which is taking place in almost all the organisms and it involves enzymes in it so we have one full chapters of enzyme waiting for us in the upcoming classes uh, now let's move to the 12th point the main features used to place plant and animal into the appropriate kingdoms are uh, what are the differences between the plant and animals indirectly? Uh, presence of cell wall is in the case of plant. Presence of chlorophyll in the chloroplast. So chloroplast is basically a cell organelle which is having the liquid, the green color pigment liquid, which is your chlorophyll. The vacuole size, uh, the plants generally have larger vacuoles and the animals generally have smaller 
and uh, we do not call them as vacuoles instead of them we call them as vesicles plants are autotrophic and the animals are generally heterotrophic in nature exceptions are always their people okay so let's quickly move on to the uh, classification of animals the animals can be classified into two vertebrate and invertebrate so vertebrate basically means they have the vertebral column vertebral col vertebral column basically means the backbone okay or in the higher classes we'll be talking about the notochord so notochord we will not uh, learn as of right now we'll be learning about that in the higher classes so uh, the invertebrates will not be having the vertebral column that basically means the backbone is not present in the case of invertebrates so let's talk about the vertebrates you we have the following vertebrates uh, the first one is mam the first one is the mammals then we have the birds reptiles amphibians and fishes so fishes you have already seen that they are aquatic in nature that means living in water that is fresh water or marine water and they basically have wet scale on them very important point and they're going to do the process of respiration that means a process of breathing or exchange of gases to be more specific uh, with the help of gills and the gills in them are basically covered with operculum so uh, let's let's see if we can i can show you the operculum in it uh, it was yeah so this this cover which you can see of the gills is basically called as the operculum so operculum is there and um, so after operculum, uh, the next point that you need to understand is uh, fins. They basically have fins that every one of us know. Now amphibians, amphi basically means two, beans basically means the organisms so, or animals. So they're going to live in uh, aquatic environment or they're going to they're gonna live on terrestrial. That means on land also, both land and water organisms. Generally, they have a slimy skin that basically means they have a mucus on the top of it. They are exothermic. Even the fishes are basically exothermic. So what do I basically mean by exothermic? Exothermic basically means that they cannot maintain their body temperature. If the temperature changes, uh, they're going to die. Okay, so that is what I mean by exothermic. And the opposite of that is basically endothermic. Endothermic basically means if the temperature changes of the environment, they're going to do something or the other. Their body going to do something or the other so that they can maintain their body temperature till a certain limit. So if I give an example, if, uh, it's, if there is an extreme cold, in that case, um, uh, the, uh, we, will be, we will be starting to shiver. So the shivering or the cracking noise of our uh, teeth will be just because to produce uh, heat inside our body uh, to keep keep our body warmer. So um, that is the endo and exothermic stuff. So they basically can breathe through skin, they can breathe through lungs, they can breathe through gills and they basically have a, something very important that is the tadpole stage. If you look at the stage of that uh, like frog development you find that it looks more like a fish uh, um, a stingray kind of fish um, and it does not look like a frog so it, that stage of the life that larva stage is called as tadpole larva and this process is called as metamorphosis it is not there in syllabus that is for extra information so let's talk about uh, now the reptiles. Reptiles basically have a leathery or the rubbery shells on them and uh, they have leathery or rubbery shells on the egg and they basically have, they are basically exothermic. They have a dry scale. Please understand wet and dry scale. Um, wet scales are present in fishes and dry scales are present in the case of reptiles. Uh, they do not go to water for breeding, whereas amphibian, our amphibian used to go to water there for the breeding process, whereas, whereas the reptiles do not require water for breeding. Okay, then we have the birds. Birds, uh, that's a very common thing that they have a feather, they have a beak, they have a wings and they're endothermic in nature. The very important feature that is of mammals is the mammary glands. So mammary glands are basically... Uh, to see please understand this uh, the mammary glands are basically the breast and uh, in the females these are basically meant to nourish the young ones even in the males also we have the mammary glands but they are not functional okay so the presence of mammary glands is very very important and distinguishing feature of the mammals and they basically can have hair they can have fur 
and they are endothermic in nature they have a placenta so placenta is what uh, it is uh, helping in the exchange of gases between the mother and the baby so it is a it's a connection link which is helping in the exchange of material which are required and the materials which are not required they basically have teeth uh, so we basically have incisors canines premolars and molars so these are different type of teeth which we have so that's all about the main characteristic classification of them uh, now we'll move on to the characteristics and classification of uh, invertebrate group so we have so many invertebrate groups uh, here we'll be talking about arthropods only uh, the arthropods are classified into four myriapodas insectas arachnidas and crustaceans so if we talk about the uh, general characteristics of phylum arthropoda you find that they basically have segmented body okay there are so many segmented that they can be head they can be thorax and they can be abdomen okay they basically have jointed appendages what do i basically mean by jointed appendages if i look at the leg of the insect i'm gonna find somewhat like this that is basically the jointed appendages uh, they basically have exoskeleton which is made up of chitin so if you by chance would have kept your legs on a cockroach and uh, the cracking noise that cracking noise is basically of the breakdown of the exoskeleton exoskeleton is basically the skeleton which is present outside and um, they do not have a backbone they are basically invertebrate so let's quickly talk about uh, the differences in them and uh, for the differences i will show you this particular diagram so insectas generally they have six legs that basically means three pairs of leg whereas arachnidas they generally have four pairs of leg arachnidas are meant for only spiders okay uh, please understand this spiders do not come under the insects okay then we have crustaceans so the best example you can take is basically your crowns and myriapodas you can take the best example as your centipedes and your millipedes so these are the examples of it now uh, all of them basically have exoskeleton here you need to understand that they basically have a head they basically have a thorax they basically have an abdomen so the body is divided into head thorax and abdomen but here instead of um, the separate head and thorax they basically have fused head and thorax so that is called as cephalothorax cephalothorax so the head and uh, thorax are fused and they have two segments here also the head and thorax are fused uh, here we do not have such uh, classification because the body is divided into so many segments okay so um, then uh, they basically can have two pairs of antennas uh, instead of antennas they basically have uh, some uh, uh, tentacles or pedipalps uh, for keeping their prey near to the mouth and not to allow them to escape similar is the case with this also that is crustaceans and uh, here in the case of myriapodas they generally have antennas uh, insectas generally have wings they do not have wings no wings no wings please understand this in the case of insectas there, there are generally two pairs of uh, wings present uh, one can be vestigial or both of them can be vestigial okay vestigial basically means of no use example here includes the warps the ants and the butterflies here the examples include your scorpions spiders here we have the prawns we have the crabs and then we here we basically have the millipedes and centipedes so that is the differences between that's very important people generally the question comes from this uh, so there is what written over here my reproducers have many segments in the body they have one or two pairs of appendages one or two pair of appendages coming out from one segment so understand this this is one segment second segment third segment fourth segment so there can be one leg coming out like this in one of the few of the organism in the sum of the organism from one individual segment there can be two legs coming out from it so that is how we differentiate between the centipedes and millipedes also so from one single segment there are four legs coming in directly so uh, they basically include the centipedes and millipedes the insects basically have uh, three segments in the body that is head thorax and abdomen they basically have uh, 
three pairs of appendages in them. That's very important, three pairs of appendages. That means six appendages in them. Uh, they basically have two pairs of wings. Either one of them can be vestigial or both of them can be vestigial. They basically have an exoskeleton. This exoskeleton is very important because this exoskeleton prevents the loss of water, uh, which is taking place where the trachea. Trachea is basically your wind pipe. Uh, examples include the bees and butterfly. Arachnidas basically have the head and thorax which are fused together and they, that is called as a cephalothorax and they basically have four pair of appendages. Very important. They have pedipalps so that they can hold their prey. It includes the spiders and scorpions. Uh, crustaceans basically have the head and thorax again fused. They basically have four or five pair of appendages. Or more than that is also possible in this case and they're gonna breathe through lungs sorry they're gonna breathe through gills that's very important and uh, crustaceans crabs of course they are aquatic in nature crowns they are aquatic in nature so that is also the point of difference between them so let's quickly finish this point people that's a very lengthy chapter um, we'll finish this chapter within uh, a few more minutes uh, so now talk up we'll talk about the plants uh, the plants are basically classified into four or five groups uh, like telophyta bryophyta tetrophyta uh, gymnosperms and geosperms that is not in the syllabus uh, so we, what we have in the syllabus is we basically have classified plants into two ferns and the flowering plants so flowering plants are also called as angiosperms and these ferns are basically called as uh, pteridophyta. pteridophyta. Please understand this. This P is silent over here. And we have further classified the flowering plant into dicot and monocot. That's very important. That will be coming um, frequently in your upcoming uh, classes, uh, the dicot and monocot stuff. So let's quickly understand this, people, now. Um, so ferns basically have no fruits on them okay they do not have seeds in them instead of the seeds they basically have spores in them okay and they do not have flowers and they are primitive vascular bundle the primitive vascular bundle basically means first of all understand what is vascular bundle vascular bundle is uh, xylem plus phloem they are together called as uh, vascular bundle. So when I say primitive vascular bundle, the vascular bundle which was not well developed, okay, that is basically the primitive vascular bundle. So they have less developed vascular bundle in them. Instead of roots, they have rhizomes in them. And uh, they basically have underground stems also in them. Uh, rhizomes can be called as uh, underground stems also. Uh, there is no much of differentiation between the root and stem in certain cases. They produce pores underneath the leaf. Instead of leaf, we call that particular thing as fronds. So I will show you the picture of it. Um, so this is basically your fronds. So if you look at, at the bottom of it, you can see some black uh, black dots. So that underneath that's uh, this leaves that is uh, fronds. Uh, you find these spores. So uh, they, they're gonna burst open and they're gonna spread out uh, for uh, uh, reproduction process. So flowering plant is opposite of it. They basically have uh, the fruits in them and they basically produce seeds. So no fruit, fruits, they produce seeds, they, they produce flowers, and they have advanced vascular bundles. So we have seen the four differences between them. Let's quickly go over the monocot and dicot. The flowering plants are con uh, classified into two, monocot and dicot. So monocot basically means what? Uh, the full name is monocotyledon. Monocotyledon, this is to be there, okay? Joined together apart from... Uh, if you remove this cot, monocotyledon, dicotyledon, or to be more specific, monocotyledone. So we pronunciate it like that. So monocotyledone, the best example is basically your rice. If you look at the rice, you're gonna find one single cotyledon, where if you look at, uh, let's say the pea, you're gonna find that two specific structures like this. So if you look at the structure of the seed, you're gonna find that it is having this kind of structure in it. So this particular thing is basically your cotyledon. And this is basically called as your plumule 
from which your uh, shoot will be coming and the lower portion is basically called as radical and from the radical your root will be coming from here shoot will be coming so uh, that's a difference uh, between them that's a major bit difference between them uh, the monocot basically have fibrous root fibrous root basically means from the one point the root will be coming out whereas in the case of dicot they basically have tap root so tap root will be somewhat like that of your carrot okay so um, they basically have reticulate venation now what do i basically mean by reticulate venation so it's a kind of uh, venation uh, which is opposite of parallel venation so for this let me draw and uh, let me explain you then you will understand better so first of all understand what is let's say this is basically your main midrib and in this main midrib you basically have some small veins which are going parallel like that in the case of your grasses so you find that this is your parallel venation but if you look at the uh, people tree um, uh, you're gonna find that there, there is mid this is basically the midrib which is becoming thick as it is going down and that is getting branching 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 a lot of branching is taking place and then your leaf is basically formed okay so like this uh, your leaf will be formed and uh, and there'll be a lot of branching in it so this branching kind of thing is basically called as reticulate venation now this is extremely important people uh, there have been so many questions from this particular point only uh, that they basically have um, petals petals in the multiple of three and uh, in the dicot they basically have in the multiple of uh, four and five okay so let's quickly understand this uh, with the help of uh, this diagram okay so monocot basically have three petals they basically have four or five multiples of four or five that means eight or twelve so now we say that twelve is here also twelve is here also but we'll look at the other characteristics also people okay so monocot one c dicot means you can see two cotyledons are present inside it so uh, root uh, root xylem and phloem basically forms a ring that and all thing is not required as of right now this is required reticulate venation and parallel parallel venation and reticulate venation so that are the differences between them and um, then next what we have is the viruses so viruses people are one of the very important and very interesting organisms visible on the earth or found on the earth and maybe they can be found on the outer space also um, what we have in the case of virus nothing we, they basically have an outer coat and inside that outer coat there is presence of uh, uh, dna so that is basically the viruses the outer coat that we have this outer coat is basically made up of protein and the genetical material that we have here the genetical material can be either your dna or it can be your rna so as i've told you in the uh, in the previous discussions also in this video itself that there are two possibilities dna and rna in the case of viruses now they are both considered both as living and non-living why because uh, uh, outside the living system that means outside a living organism they are uh, uh, non-living but when they enter inside a living system or a living organism they start uh, showing the activities or the characteristics of living organisms they uh, the very important thing that you need to understand is that uh, students generally ask me a question that uh, how if they are just a small speck of thing how they are coming into our body man they are coming you they are not coming inside your body you are uh, taking them onto your body and inside your body okay so they are just lying somewhere or the other it's it's you who is going near to them or inviting them so what what you, what you need to understand is that they do not have their own excretion process they do not have their uh, reproduction process they do not have their sensitivity process they don't have anything of their own except the uh, dna or the rna which is a genetical material in them and they're going to use this dna and rna and they're going to use the resources of the cell to make the protein which protein this membrane protein outside 
okay so you would have seen in the picture of uh, this particular virus this is basically your tobacco mosaic virus so this kind of thing this all thing which i have drawn right now is basically the protein coat and inside this uh, there will be presence of the dna so they are uh, not made up of uh, cells and uh, the size basically is around 1 nm nm here is nanometer and 1 nanometer is equal to 10 to the power minus 19 mm so the last topic people that we have is uh, the construction of the keys and uh, and uh, i have taken an example from the uh the our textbook prescribed textbook that is johns and johns um if i'm right uh, that's called as uh, yes johns and johns igcse biology third edition uh, this is a textbook example which i have taken directly and um, so we basically have 1 2 3 4 4 flowers with us and uh, we we going to go for making dichotomous key so what is dichotomous key so di basically means two and cotomus uh, i also don't know what does that mean so if you know what does the word cotomus means you can write down in the chat box i mean you can write down in the comment box and you can let me know so uh, there are two statements and generally and uh, both of the statements are generally opposite of each other let's say if i say have uh, more than 5 petals or the opposite will be less than 5 petals okay so like that more than or equal to five petals one statement and opposite of that so that is basically a dichotomous uh, key and uh, there are two descriptions which are given at a time and we have to select either of the descriptions this basically lead to the another pair of descriptions out of this we going to select one of it and then this will be leading to the another two pairs of it then from that we going to select one of it and then we going to go to the another two pairs of it like that it will keep on going unless and until we find the name of the organism okay it ends with the organism's name and uh, uh, they generally give uh, mcq questions from this uh, to find out uh, uh, the name of the organisms from the key so um, for construction of the key we have to focus on uh, focus more on the features that are clearly varying between the living organisms do not try to take uh, the colors which are not specifically varying so let's take an example of it uh, on the same uh, uh, thing we have uh, classified two two the first uh, line which we have is 4 plus 2 petal and 5 petals so if you look into this it is having 1 2 3 4 5 5 petals this is having 1 2 1 2 3 4 5 5 petals this is also 1 2 3 4 5 5 petals and here we basically have 1 2 1 2 3 4 2 4 so here we basically have 2 plus 4 or 4 plus 2 petals and 5 petals so we 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 got the name of this particular flower as viola flava okay and um, then we have uh, the five petals so from the five petals if you are selecting we have again leading to two of them so overlapping petals or no overlapping petals so overlapping petals you can see in the case of erodium so the petals are overlapping to each other so we get a name that this particular uh, organism is erodium what will happen is that we will not be given this particular name people okay uh, and uh, and then uh, by looking at this characteristics oh then we will get to know that overlapping petals uh, we will we'll see the overlapping petals are there uh, it is five petal and overlapping petal then we'll get to know that yes this is your erodium so we're going to write it as erodium then we have no overlapping petals so then we're going to look at the two of them it is uh, having uh, two color petals or one color petal so two color petal here is basically your limnanthus so and one color petal is basically your uh, potent 
Tila, potent Tila. Okay, so what you can do is that you can uh, remove this particular name and then let's try this once again. So we have this four of them. So we have two plus four petals and five petals. So two plus four petal is in this. So this basically becomes your viola. Okay, and then five petals are of two type overlapping petals and no overlapping petals. So uh, the no overlapping pet overlapping petals are basically your erodium. So this basically becomes your erodium. And then um, two color petals or one color petal. Uh, two color petal is basically limnanthus. So this basically becomes your limnanthus, and this basically becomes your potentilla. Okay. So that's all uh, for this particular chapter, people. Uh, within uh, one hour, ten minutes, we have finished this chapter. Uh, stay tuned and subscribe the channel uh, so that I can upload more for the videos. Thank you.